Guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. <laughs> But now I'll switch to English. Um, uh, Erard kindly said that it would be more efficient, but uh, I think there are much more reasons uh, for not speaking in German uh, at this occasion. Um, I'm very pleased with the invitation to, uh, to speak here at the uh, event of, um, uh, uh, how you call it, uh, CA3, um, the forum for uh, Claren, uh, Germany, the forum meeting at the end of this first round, uh, this first program. Um, I've seen lots of things yesterday, heard lots of things yesterday that uh, confirmed the impression that I already had that, that Germany is a very strong and diverse country with a lot of contributions to um, um, what uh, is the research infrastructure for uh, uh, language and speech technology in Europe. Um, and not only that, it's also very well equipped to, uh, to use that infrastructure or to, to gear that infrastructure towards the needs of several uh, user communities, notably the digital humanities, but also lots of social sciences. I think that's the kind of strength that you would like to see in the national consortia of Claire and Eric, and uh, so I'm very honored to be able to, to talk to you today. Um, as as Eric, uh, Eric said, I only joined Claire and Eric uh, in September last year. Um, and of course, I can explain to you uh, in detail um, how the governance is organized and where the funding comes from, etc. Um, but for this occasion, uh, I've chosen to um, share with you some of the more reflective thoughts that the experience up till now um, has brought me. And um, so, in my overview, uh, I will say a few things uh, under the header of CA3 about uh, sustainability of, of research infrastructures. And then I'll address the multilinguality uh, issue um, and uh, also dive into a few more other multi-cases. Uh, and then I'll have some recommendations following from the reflection and observations that I uh, uh, will have, have intertwined in, in, uh, in this presentation. And, and keep in mind that the, the, the background of these recommendations is that, that we all should be very careful about things to do, things that can be done to ensure that the uh, investment in time and um, intellectual effort uh, uh, is, is a sustainable investment, that it will lead to the next stages of uh, an infrastructure um, based on uh, excellent language and speech technology and also an infrastructure that attracts excellent researchers from the humanities and social sciences. Because if you don't pay attention, it may all be something that is very, very vulnerable. Um, so about this sustainability thing, I try to, uh, to turn the um, the concept of, of, of this forum, this, this, the label of this forum, into something a, a, a bit more abstract. So the C, not for clever, but for continuous, because that also applies to many other research infrastructures. And then, of course, uh, in English, access, asset data, and analysis tools. Not fully one-to-one, -one, but sort of related to the three concepts that were introduced yesterday. Um, because this is the kind of thing that you find in many, many infrastructures um, in all kinds of uh, uh, disciplinary domains, including biomedical science, uh, social sciences, of course. Um, uh, and, and we are, uh, in, we live in a, t in a time where the concept of research infrastructure is gaining lots and lots of popularity. Um, so there, there are bigger and smaller initiatives that all aim to address the infrastructural needs of, of disciplinary communities. Uh, but in the end, uh, all this work also has to be affordable. And um, 
we will all be in competition for the inherently limited funds that are available. So this all requires uh, balancing and uh, a governance and, and guidance and, uh, 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 of course, excellence in order to be able to, um, uh, to, to, to be strong in that competition. Um, let's see, yeah, okay. So if we um, turn now to the topic uh, that was uh, in the title, multilinguality, um, this is, uh, of course, a, a typical thing for Europe. Not unique for Europe, definitely not, but uh, certainly very typical. And one of the driving forces for the early uh, research and, and development work in, uh, in language technology. Um, we, um, uh, multilinguality is often mentioned to be, uh, to bring challenges to, to Europe. Um, of course, uh, uh, this may be related to the historical um, notion of uh, uh, the Tower of Babel, which introduced multilinguality as a curse or, a, or as a punishment. Um, but actually, worldwide and, and also in Europe, multilinguality is the default condition under which many people live. Monolinguality is the exception rather than, uh, than the norm. And multilinguality uh, comes uh, uh, in many ways, or comes with an, a number of additional things like multiculturality, um, multinationality, of course. Uh, that's all, at least, um, a thing that you can observe more and more uh, in Europe, and, and it will not be different in the rest of the world. So, multilinguality is a, a, a default condition for many people in, in their daily lives. So it's not something that you should take as an obstacle, but as something that you have to live with, uh, but also that brings many perspectives and opportunities. I'm very well aware of the fact that um, in terms of uh, building Europe uh, and keeping Europe strong in the rest of the world, uh, there is also the economic dimension. So uh, what you see is that within Europe, there's lots of debate about how the digital single market can be uh, established and, uh, and strengthened, um, which is a very important goal. And uh, many of people, of the people working in natural language processing or in, or in uh, related data sciences, uh, are very capable of contributing to, over, to, to overcoming any linguistic barriers in establishing that, that market. Uh, not always that is recognized uh, in, in the debates about how to establish that digital single market, but uh, um, we know the history, so we know that uh, the work that's being done within the context of, of Clarin and other communities that work on natural language processing and speech technology, etc., uh, are very crucial to, to make this happen. Um, but for the researchers' communities that are not primarily uh, serving uh, the economic processes, um, but are researching um, cultural, societal, um, uh, and other um, phenomena. Um, the multilinguality also brings a lot of interesting perspectives. So, for example, uh, the, mere, the mere challenge of, of crossing linguistic boundaries, studying uh, the relationship between languages um, can be very, uh, it has a long history and, and can be very interesting and uh, leads to insights that can be applied in many ways. Of course, there's also uh, the topic of inclusive societies and uh, another important thing is that with all the resources in all those various languages, um, with links to local or regional uh, history, this multilinguality brings an asset to Europe because it enables us, us to do a comparative research that would be uh, l uh, yeah, less rich 
uh, if it would not take place in this multilingual context. So multilinguality is not just one thing, it's not um, one characteristic of Europe that may be taken as a burden or a curse, but it's actually uh, lots and lots of things that, uh, that are interesting and, and bring uh, um, important conditions for excellent research. If there is an obstacle there, it is because people tend to be um, uh, not very sensitive of, of the other person's perspective. Um, but given the, um, uh, the history of, of work uh, uh, in natural language processing uh, and, and other uh, fields, um, it's, it's very clear that uh, research infrastructures uh, have an added value here. Because what do research infrastructures do? And, and Glaren is, of course, the example that we have in mind today. Um, so research infrastructures are not just data centers or not, not just uh, uh, a bunch of, of services. Uh, it starts with shared knowledge and expertise. And that's, of course, something that has always played a role in, in the history, the intellectual history of Europe. Um, early knowledge circulation with uh, letters in, in Latin um, were a starting point for collaboration in Europe without uh, the problem of um, multiple languages because there was just this one language is used for, for knowledge circulation. And today this collaboration of, of scholars and scientists is um, supposed to end into uh, the open science which is also uh, highly supported or very much supported by the policies uh, in Europe. Um, another element is interoperability and that concept too has a long history in Europe uh, and in the rest of the world of course, but it started with the standardized character sets, again Latin, um, and nowadays we could give the example of metadata standards for digital libraries. And another important element is, is cooperation, uh, from ontology design uh, to facilities for seamless uh, distributed data, uh, the um, uh, rules and, and principles for uh, intellectual property right, for, uh, per, for example, parallel corpora, these are all issues that require lots and lots of cooperation. And we have a history there, so, um, um, if we consider the, the old network networks um, in science as the beginning of uh, uh, contemporary research infrastructures, we, there is this continuity. Um, so what could you say uh, about um, um, the role of, of, of language technology in, in this emerging uh, concept of digital research infrastructure? Well, in, uh, in the midst of, uh, of the previous century, um, the very first applications, non-numerical applications of, uh, um, of computers were uh, in the field of machine translation, as many of you uh, will know. Um, and that in the second half of the century led to enormous investments in, in machine translation in all kinds of ways. And not many of those investments um, led to systems that uh, were actually used or are, uh, more extremely are still being used, but they led to an enormous uh, potential uh, uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in the form of knowledge and understanding of how to uh, process natural language. Of course, there were other topics uh, worked on, uh, but they were less focusing on, I focus now on the uh, multilingual uh, uh, the functionality or the, the in, in particular the, uh, the functionality that you, that, that crosses the boundaries of, uh, uh, of languages. Then there was the digital turn that made a big change because uh, when there was more data available um, than ever before um, uh, in digital format, the, then we the field could start working on statistical models next to the rule-based approaches that are still popular and um, uh, 
effective in, uh, in many use cases. The investments in, in cross-language search engines started and there were many demonstrations of the potential of all these technologies in the cultural and, scholar, uh, and scholarly domains. And, and one example is the portal of Europeana, which in the end turned out to be uh, primarily of interest to the average citizen, but discussions are ongoing to, to turn Europeana into uh, a resource that's also useful for research purposes. And, and of course, this gives all kinds of reasons to, uh, for collaboration with Europeana and, uh, um, and infrastructural initiatives like, like Clarin and, and also Daria. Um, maybe, maybe interesting to ask, are there people in the room that uh, have never used Europeana? I suppose you all have heard the name, but uh, yeah, okay, it is it's more or less like what I encounter in, when I talk to my friends about it. I mean, I have kind of friends that typically go to museums and to concerts and to read books, etc., read newspapers, but Europeana is somehow still a bit invisible uh, for them. And uh, so I think uh, um, collaboration uh, could help us all to make that investment something that is not wasted in the end. Um, and then in the 21st century, uh, the development continued. Uh, and I think nowadays we could say that language data uh, or language resources is no longer seen as uh, linguistic resource, but, but as something that uh, falls under the header of, of, of data. So natural language processing is now a form of data science. And um, we're somewhere in between the very first concepts that played a role in, um, in the application of natural language processing in the field of digital humanities, namely uh, distant reading. Um, not to forget, this is not in the place of close reading, but it's, I would consider this to be a form of uh, postponed reading. And there is another concept that's now uh, attracting lots and lots of attention and, um, and turmoil and, and, and lots of events are organized for the thing called the European Open Science Cloud. We will be part of that. Uh, whether we understand it or not, we will be part of that. I'll tell you. So, what kind of um, things could you say about uh, the role that Clarin could have uh, um, given um, the, the multilinguality in Europe and the, and the research agendas of the social sciences and the humanities? Um, well, as I said already, this, this multilingual base uh, is, is, is actually an asset. It offers a rich basis for comparative research of all kinds of societal phenomena, and in particular those that uh, are reflected in the, the way people use language. And then you can think of uh, migration patterns uh, or intellectual history or language variation. Um, so the, anal the analysis services for text and speech data um, can really be seen as a pillar for a thing that is sometimes called a social and cultural analytics. And if you take that seriously, then um, language or text and speech are not just data, but they're actually social and cultural data. Um, and if we take that seriously, and if we uh, uh, continue to uh, refine our, our services and infrastructure, then um, that could be put to use, but under the condition that we also work on other things, namely the development of uh, methodological frameworks, because this concept of uh, language as social or cultural data requires uh, that there is integrated processing of this data type with other data types because otherwise we will do this in isolation and we have to work together uh, with other uh, 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 disciplinary domains. The research agendas of, of the social sciences um, are a necessary ingredient for our agenda to process language as social data. 
Okay, are we in a good shape as Claire and Eric to do that? Um, here you see a, an image that is not identical, but uh, in, in idea, uh, one, one to one uh, related to the, to the slide that uh, Erhard showed yesterday. Uh, these are the countries that are now um, involved in uh, Clarin Eric. So Eric is the concept of this international consortium working on research infrastructure. Um, the member countries are the 18 countries here. Uh, you also see smaller dots um, that represent the uh, centers that are associated with Claire and Eric, and you can see a few things, namely that in Germany there are many, many, many of them, and that are also uh, centers in countries that are not members. So actually, the coverage of, of Clarin or the synergy, uh, the potential for synergy, uh, is, is uh, very strong because uh, a very big part of Europe is involved. That means that many, many languages and also many, uh, not only official languages, but also the local uh, and dialectical variants uh, are, are well covered. Um, and also there's uh, quite a, a diversity in, in expertise that is being covered by this consortium. Um, I would like now to take the concept of multilinguality um, in a bit more uh, liberal way and also apply it to communication um, uh, uh, in, in, in general. Um, so language multilinguality could be coupled to the, the concept of, of uh, uh, languages with a name, uh, or variants of languages with a name. But of course, language variation is a, a concept that is much broader. Um, um, it's the topic of study in, in social linguistics. Uh, uh, and, and for quite a long time, natural language processing and language variation have been separate, quite separate uh, um, fields. But currently, there are all kinds of reasons for having them collaborating uh, more strongly, uh, and that has everything to do with the increase of data that is available to, um, uh, to study the phenomena. And um, um, and I'll get back to that later. And the other topic um, is multimodality. So there's not only uh, the traditional uh, forms or data types associated with, uh, with language, namely text and speech, but um, with the possibility and the uh, enormous growth of, of uh, recording multimedia, um, uh, to, to make multimedia recordings of uh, daily life uh, and uh, uh, cultural objects, etc. Uh, there's a lot more that can be uh, that can be studied nowadays. So, um, the next part of my talk will be about uh, uh, the study of language variation and the implications that follow from that for a uh, research infrastructure and the potential um, attention for multimodality. And then I will uh, end with a few remarks on uh, in this block on the consequences for multidisciplinarity. So uh, language variation uh, is a field of study that, that, that shows uh, which parameters in language use uh, are there that, that help people to shape their identity or that are used by people to shape their identity. And uh, traditionally that was uh, done based on relatively small uh, data sets. Uh, William Leboeuf was one of the, uh, uh, the key figures in that field. Um, uh, he introduced the concept of um, the um, uh, observer paradox, where uh, um, the, it was argued that uh, if you want to study people people's behavior, people's linguistic behavior, or their, their behavior as language user, um, then there's always the problem that 
they will be aware of you observing them and that will change the way they use, uh, they use their language. Nowadays, people have um, uh, used social media uh, platforms for expressing themselves in all kinds of ways, uh, including language and speech uh, and videos, etc. And for them, that's not, even though you can, you can well argue that this is a form of performance, uh, people don't feel it uh, to be a performance as it would be if the spotlights would be on them, because they're using their own devices to do that. It's part of their daily life. So that sort of reduces the, uh, uh, um, the methodological problem of, uh, uh, of the observer, because the language users themselves provide the data um, spontaneously, you could say, you know, triggered by the technical possibilities. Um, so for a contemporary language, it could very well be that uh, if we are able to collect um, social media data, uh, that we can start studying language variation in a totally different way. Um, the growth of, uh, uh, of channels where people uh, express themselves um, is immense. This is a figure showing the increase uh, between 2011 and 2015 for certain social media platforms. Um, if you think about the fact that this all started somewhere in 2004, uh, this long tail is sort of meaningless. Um, uh, and if you would compare this with uh, figures about uh, research done into the analysis of social media data, you would see similar figures, because in many, many conferences, people that do natural language processing or also, or yeah, for, for language and speech, they uh, use these data types a lot. Um, and there are even conferences that, uh, that are specifically focusing on the analysis of social media data. So s similar figures uh, could be given for the research interests in this type of data. Um, one of my PhD students did, did uh, a study on uh, the variation in, in Twitter messages, and she studied the effects of age of, um, uh, of Twitterers, and then distinguished between uh, what um, male and female users do, with the, uh, uh, and, and here you see a few uh, figures that in itself are very interesting, but not necessarily for today, but it, it, it shows that uh, age determines how easily people can be perceived to belong to a certain social um, uh, category. Uh, so the number of personal pronouns used differs over age categories, the, the number of, or the, the length of words and tweets differs uh, across age categories, and the, the use of other um, uh, elements or non-linguistic elements like links and hashtags also differs uh, per age category. Um, this, the, the study was based on um, 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 data that was collected uh, via um, um, a sort of crowdsourcing instrument uh, to collect data about people's um, about the estimations of, of people's, people's age, of the age of Twitterers. And, and you can see that uh, automatic predictions um, and human predictions um, have, um, have a similar pattern. So in, in a way, you could see that as a validation of, of this result. And, and the, the, the conclusion is that age of older users is, is harder to determine. This is the kind of studies, and it's actually not about this study or the quality of that study, but it's an illustration of the fact that if you use Twitter data, you, you get the possibility to study uh, phenomena related to um, uh, human behavior. Uh, because, uh, um, and, and this is uh, something that will only grow. Um, but if you, um, take this potential seriously, there are a number of methodological questions. And uh, one is that uh, um, the collection of data uh, is, is done in a totally different way in comparison to 
uh, traditional hypothesis-driven collection methods that have been used in the uh, qualitative social sciences. So a, a question is, um, in which respects these approaches can be integrated if the methodology is, is uh, so diverse, so different? Another question is, of course, which social phenomena can actually be captured by, by text mining? There, there must be many limits, not in the, uh, not in the way um, uh, researchers jump onto this type of data, uh, because they, uh, they like it a lot, but it, it could be a good question to, to be restrictive there, or w whether we should be restrictive there. Um, and other important things I already uh, hinted uh, at it is uh, that in communicative settings, people uh, shape an identity by exploiting the room that there is for language variation. So if they want to seem young, they can adjust their language to what they think is the language of the young. So if you draw conclusions, you have to be sure that you have a mechanism to handle this agency. Um, if you want social scientists to do serious things with the outcome of, of uh, text mining, um, then you have to be aware of what they need. So um, there are various methodologies in the social sciences uh, for qualitative data analysis. For example, the computer-assisted qualitative data analysis software tools that are abundant. Um, and they apply that sometimes do the same type of, of data with code books, et cetera, to, uh, that sort of reflect the uh, working hypothesis that they work with. So if we have text classification to offer them as a, an alternative way, an automatic way to do annotation, a bit inspired by how this was done in the, in the humanities, um, then the question is how we can integrate that, and definitely we have to uh, work together. And as I already said, um, the, um, uh, this new type of data to, to fuel the, the study of, of language variation um, and, and to study the effects of, of language variation um, on, on the context and on, uh, and, and on the, uh, um, the models or the, the predictions that come out of that, you, uh, it's an interesting uh, question whether this observer's paradox will um, play a, a role and how it will um, evolve if it will remain. The other multi-case that I wanted to discuss is, is uh, multimodality. So if uh, uh, multimodal communication uh, or recordings of uh, communication, human communication, involving all the modalities uh, is interesting because in those recordings there is all kinds of cues for, uh, for interaction, all kinds of emotional layers are, uh, are uh, available and not just the, um, um, the textual uh, representation or the transcript of, of the speech. Um, and given the growth of data, this is uh, an interesting complementary type of data for the field of natural language processing. And already quite a lot of work has been done there. Um, um, so I, I will now report on a study that was done uh, on the exploration of um, emotional layers in uh, everything that goes beyond the verbal expressions proper. And of course, um, there are many things that, that count as non-verbal. Body posture, hand gesture, head movement, the tone of voice, uh, um, prosody, laughter. Um, and this is um, called uh, um, effective computing or social signal processing. But again, it's an example of a human behavior analysis rather than language analysis. The study that I briefly want to go through had several objectives, and that's the reason why I include it, because it shows that uh, these studies um, uh, can play multiple roles. So first of all, there were the theoretical and strategic reasons to, to start that work. It was um, um, 
the, the idea was that insight, insight uh, should be gained on how the different modes, uh, the, the verbal and the, and the non-verbal of narrative expressions relate to each other. It was meant to gain improved understanding of emotional, motivational, and, and cognitive processes, and, and then in particular um, uh, in the way they are addressed in, in spoken narratives. The whole idea was that this could be a good instrument to reinforce the collaboration between social sciences and natural language processing uh, experts. And also, it, 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 it was uh, an example of reuse and repurposing of humanities data. Um, and maybe the, I should have explained that first, but the study was conducted on the basis of uh, a large collection of uh, oral history narratives. Um, and um, oral history interviews are uh, a very interesting type of uh, human behavior because uh, um, they, they contain that they are a recording of behavior because it, um, people are supposed to um, react to questions of an interviewer uh, um, uh, that address very specific events in their in their lives, their life stories. So people um, may or may not filter um, the way they um, the instrument they choose to to tell their story or the um, how to how to stage their uh, uh, their narrative. But um, it, it is even if it would be staged with a very interesting type of human behavior. And these recordings are. Uh, available in many, many places, and in some cases they are easily, they, they are open access and they can be uh, used for research. And they are very layered, beca also because they are not, uh, they, they are not uh, uh, scripted and they are uh, um, rich with emotional layers. Um, so. And, and this type of material is t traditionally used for humanities research. They're even created because humanities researchers have a certain uh, research question. Um, but it's a very nice example of how these materials can be reused. And um, to make the link with Clarin again, quite recently we had a workshop on what the Clarin infrastructure could offer for people working with this type of data, which led to uh, a nice list of um, recommendations, and um, if we are able to implement those recommendations before the end of next year, I think we will have uh, enhanced the uh, the value uh, of the Clarity infrastructure that in such a way that it now uh, has this strong pillar of, of data that is interesting for social scientists as well. Well, just briefly, in this study, a comparison was made between the emotional cues in the verbal layers and the nonverbal layers, and this slide shows that uh, the correlation was um, um, rather limited, and that brings the interesting question um, whether we define the concept of emotion uh, well enough, whether we have uh, um, ground truth data that uh, is uh, refined enough. So based on this experiment, you already see uh, <clears throat> lots of uh, recommendations and, and, and desiderata for the Clarin infrastructure. Um, I think uh, the, the, both the language variation and the, and the multimodality case illustrate that uh, we should stimulate the development of corpora with uh, annotation at, at multiple modality layers. We need validated text-based sentiment analysis tools, because uh, also because the concept of sentiment is so poorly defined, and we need ground truth data that have been generated by uh, behavioral scientists. And for the um, multidisciplinarity, um, and the, the sharing of expertise and knowledge, I think it, uh, these are cases that are excellent examples where the collaboration with other research infrastructures in the social sciences and the humanities could pay off. Uh, and, and also it is these kind of studies and, and collaborations uh, bring the potential to combine uh, the concerts of 
the concerns of social sciences and, and, and maybe sciences in general um, with the general and the regular, the methodology inherent to many of the social sciences, um, with the concern of the humanities, which is traditionally focused on the individual and the particular. In order to bring these two things together, uh, these rich types of data uh, um, could be explored further, but only if the collaboration is well organized. As I said, I would say a few more things about the sustainability of these type of uh, uh, endeavors. The, the, the creation of research infrastructure and organization of the work and the involvement of excellency in the development of the infrastructure and in the use of it. And there are various aspects to that. Um, and I will address a few. Maybe it's good to be aware of uh, of this phenomenon. Um, we are trying um, to set up a collaborative network uh, with uh, um, all kinds of disciplines involved. Um, many people in, in Claire and Eric uh, uh, have a background in, in technology because they're supposed to develop uh, technology. So, um, and we have an offer for the social sciences and the humanities. Um, at the end of the day, somehow, uh, ideally, there is satisfaction on both sides. Interesting results, stunning results made possible by technology, but also research questions that are solved in a way that was unforeseen. If that's the case, then uh, all the communities involved are happy, but the expectations may not always be uh, clear and, uh, and uh, um, match, uh, match the reality at all stages of, of the process. Um, and in order to not uh, uh, end in this disillusion dip, um, we need to uh, address the, uh, the acceptance issues for, for the users that are working with our infrastructural facilities. And actually, the users should be involved in, in the development uh, very strongly. So I already mentioned a few of those elements. Uh, there should be stimulus um, um, there, there is quite a stimulus, as, as I indicated already, for number crunching exercises that are not taking into account the theoretical frameworks from which uh, the phenomena that are underlying the data are being studied. So that could uh, scare off um, scholars. There should really be attention for the role of theory and, and validation of the things that we do with, with our data analytics um, uh, capacities. Because if we don't do that, um, um, people are maybe scared of by the potential for disruptive effects for existing traditions and practices. And, and yesterday morning, our, the keynote speaker, uh, Simone, is she here? Also mentioned many of those issues. Technology push is not the best way of uh, guaranteeing the sustainability of, uh, 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 of our infrastructure because uh, and we have to make sure that we understand the workflows uh, in the humanities and other fields. And we have to carefully look for very convincing showcases. So these are the things that help. Uh, I said it already, you should work together with um, the people that want to use your technology from the very beginning onwards. Yesterday, uh, Simona talked about source criticism as an important ingredient in the tradition of the humanities. Um, recently, the, in the Netherlands, there was a, a workshop organized that started from the same concept, but that focused on uh, tool criticism. So if users, uh, researchers, um, are able to predict the effects of, of technology and the biases that are introduced 
by, by technologies or the, the limitations uh, inherent to a technology, then they're much more willing uh, to use it because then they know uh, how to interpret the results that they get. If it's a black box, it, it won't work. And they have to do that before they start the real work. Um, and this requires, of course, uh, the availability of information, um, knowledge, and skills, etc. cetera. Um, and, and you have to prepare the fields um, in such a way that they are willing to, to take up uh, um, tool criticism as part of their daily research in the same way as they used to do that for source criticism. Other advices are decomposition of research questions into smaller questions because the smaller questions may be um, feasible to handle by um, language and speech technology or data analytics services. Uh, others may not. Um, I won't go into detail here, but this is a stunning result from the Netherlands, uh, also broadcast on the radio because the question mark behind the author of the national hymn was solved by um, uh, by text analytics. Uh, there was there is another author, um, but these are my recommendations uh, at a more abstract level. We, sh we should continue to explore the potential and the requirements for collab collaboration across disciplinary domains and to find the multilinguality in the communication that is a pitfall there. Um, the dynamics of knowledge acquisition um, should be understood. Uh, and research infrastructures do contribute to uh, knowledge acquisition. That's what they are there for. But they do it in a non-linear way. So that should be um, uh, clear. We need to uh, plan the education and training of uh, of the talents in the fields and the researcher communities, and we do have to do that in a proactive way. And another thing that I've seen, that I've seen also yesterday here at the, at the poster session, we have to trust in, in the creative minds of, of the younger, younger generation, because they will be able to renew the research agendas, and that's the best guarantee that in the end, the boundaries uh, of knowledge will be pushed. Here you see, uh, the beginning of um, um, uh, of uh, no, not the beginning. You see, you see here an object. I don't know if you recognize this. This is Rosetta Stone, which was a. You could see that as one of the first infrastructural facilities to 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 study the relationship uh, between languages. Um, so you could see it as a symbol for the work that that we are in, because it's also. Um, uh, related to uh, the research questions in, in the humanities. And I'd like to end with this slide where um, I pose the questions uh, if, if uh, research infrastructures can, can be seen as, as the pendulum that pushes the boundaries of knowledge. Of course, I'm uh, optimistic, but there are many more things to say about this image too. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank.